As we do, I'll read the whole chapter now for you. 2 Chronicles chapter 18. 2 Chronicles 18. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him, and persuaded him to go up with him unto Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together the prophets, four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides, that we may inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. His name is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. And the king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, Fetch quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, sat either of them on his throne, clothed in their robes, and they sat in a void place at the entering in of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chechnaniah, had made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, With these thou shalt push Syria until they be consumed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up unto Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the messenger that went to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold the words of the prophet, declare good to the king with one assent. Let thy words therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. And when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And he said, Go ye up and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee, that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? Then he said, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains, as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master, let them return, therefore every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil? Again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake, saying after this manner, and another saying after that manner. Then there came out a spirit, and stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chechnaniah, came near and spake, or came near and smote Micaiah upon the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Then the king of Israel said, Take ye Micaiah and carry him back to Ammon the governor of the city and to Joash the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, 
put this fellow in the prison and feed him with bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I return in peace. And Micaiah said, If thou certainly return in peace, then hath not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, all ye people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle. But put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went to the battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. For it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Therefore he said unto the chariot man, Turn thine hand, that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even. And about that time of the sun going down, he died. So here is a famous story to many. Uh, some have heard it uh, on different occasions. Uh, some have recently read it, perhaps, in a reading plan. Uh, but it always grabs me this story as you read it, just, just the, uh, the relation that is going on, where the preachers are prophesying one thing, and then the true preacher is invited in. The first thing he does is preach the same story the same thing, the same good words unto all of them. And then after he relents and begins to preach the truth unto him, and it angers the king so that he puts him away. What I'm focusing on specifically here in 2 Chronicles 18 is plan for prison. Plan for prison. Obviously focusing directly on verse 12 and verse 13. The climate here in Canada is such that for us, who would choose by our own free will to believe the word of God, the climate is such that we're automatically a front against the leaders. We're automatically an affront against the status quo. What we believe about the scriptures, and I believe that when you are a Bible-believing Christian, it's all or nothing. I run into people Amen. all the time that will say, well, I believe this about the Bible, but that I reject. Well, you can't. Call yourself a Bible-believing Christian and draw lines. You must choose to agree with all of the scriptures, or you must choose to reject all of the scriptures. It is a package deal. So again, here in Canada, with, with the laws being such as they are, and with the government and with the groups that rally against Christians being powerful as they are, it's constantly day by day becoming a more hostile environment to believe the words of God, even to stand on the words of God, not necessarily even proclaim them in any kind of fashion, but just to hold to those truths. It will eventually come out that you know these scriptures, even if you're trying to hide such things. Today, I believe, for the Bible-believing Christian, especially in Canada where we live, to keep it a little closer to home and in the context in which we abide, today, I believe that the only imminent doctrine that needs to be preached, if there was ever to be a declaration of, this is imminent, this could happen at any moment, if there's any doctrine that should be preached and thundered as if it could happen today, as if it could happen tomorrow, as if it could happen even where we're standing here right now, the imminency doctrine is that of persecution and attacks from the world. The world, and Christians need to understand this and be taught, is that persecution and tribulation and believing the Bible go hand in hand. If you are a Bible-believing Christian today, if you stand on these principles, as it was promised by Christ, tribulation is coming your way. Persecution is coming your way, and it is imminent. It can happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, right? This truth is 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 imminent. It's, it's the present reality that we live in, that, that your whole world can be turned upside down as the world turns in aggression against you. And it needs to be preached as such. It's common among Christians these days to think to themselves and to even promote this, and I've heard this many times, that if you are not loved by the world, you are not being Christ-like. 
And that, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Why? Because Christ said, if, if they hate you, well, know that they hated me first. They hate you because they hated me first. And so being a hated person is a Christ-like characteristic because Christ himself experienced that same hatred. Even recently, in an exchange with a, an independent Baptist online college executive vice president, it was said to me when I pointed out the gross error of endorsing a, a certain book written by a Johnny Nixon called Born That Way After All, which promotes actually bringing in homosexuals to work with children under the guise of, oh, they're just confused eunuchs that are really good with children. And this book preached this, and this online Baptist college endorsed the same. And many other pre preachers are involved in this, and they're just, they're very loose and very soft in the idea that these people could actually harm others. But I, I pointed out the gross error of supporting such a thought and supporting such a ministry. And I believe it's one thing for these Baptist churches to just welcome them in. Okay, you can come in. But how heinous and wicked is it for it to actually put these people in charge of children? It, it's, it's not right. And so I pointed out this error, and one of these leading preachers came to me and said, you know, go and speak your poison elsewhere. Go and... Talk to other people about these things. Instead of what I did was he made a public post and I felt compelled to respond to the public post to warn people. And he said to me, I have 4,000 reviews and none of them are negative until you come along. And my only response at that point was Luke chapter 6, 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers unto the false prophets. And the reality is this, if everyone is in love with you and you're a Christian, there's something wrong with your testimony. There's something wrong with your ministry. Either you're holding back on the truth, especially if you're a preacher and in the public eye. Either you're holding back certain truths or you're picking and choosing your message when you're going to deliver it here or when you're going to deliver it there. There's something wrong when everyone, 4,000 people, are thumbs up in you. We know that there's a whole world of people that hate Christians just for believing the simple principles of the, of the doctrines of, of Christ, let alone some of the more controversial ones. So today you have these preachers who are in lockstep with the world, and they are agreeing with the idea that we should always preach good and soft and nice to hear messages. And that's what the world wants to hear. Well, they say that's what they want to hear if they want to hear everything from us at all. Verse 12 there in the context of 2 Chronicles says this, and the messenger that went to call Micaiah, so this is, this is the messenger of the king. He comes and he's going to invite him into this big preaching ceremony where all of the greatest preachers are gathered together and they're just tickling the king's ears with what he wants to hear. The messenger goes and calls Micaiah, the one who we've always learned prophesies right things, and he's hated for it. And he spake these words unto him, saying, Behold the words that the prophets declare, good to the king with one assent. Let thy word, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. In other words, you need to trim your message and sound just like all the other preachers. You need to sound exactly like them and speak only good, positive things. Tell him to go to war. Tell him that he's going to win. Encourage him in that. And Micaiah wisely responds and says, As the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. And I find it interesting that when he first comes out and he speaks, he says exactly the same message. Go ye up and prosper, that they shall be delivered into your hand. The king knew. He was wise to it. This preacher has never said anything positive to me. What's going on here? And then he turns he says, all right. All right, here's the true message. I saw Israel scattered as sheep without a shepherd. I saw their destruction. I saw, I saw them losing this battle. And I also saw in heaven why these preachers are preaching the way they are because there is a lying spirit in their mouth and that lying spirit is telling you, go, 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 go. Why? Because God wants your destruction. And he exposes this to the king. What happens to him? He goes to prison. He proclaimed the truth and he wound up in prison. Here we are in Canada, and now the day is such that when we proclaim the truth, if we get it into the right context, if the right person hears it, we too can find ourselves in prison. You know, hate speech laws are applicable now, and if you anger enough people or anger the right group, they can apply them. The government, the Supreme Court can apply them, and you can find yourself 
put in prison. That's where we stand today. What's going to happen next year and next year and the year after that? So myself, I have resolved. I am set in my heart to plan for prison. Plan for prison. Why? Because I plan to preach the word of God. I don't like the idea of prison. That doesn't entice me. I don't want to go to prison so that I can puff up my chest and be some story in the evening news and think that I'm some great man. But I'm planning for prison because preaching the word of God is going to put me there. And preaching the word of God is ultimately what I desire to do with the rest of my life. Without reserve, without holding it back, without trimming the message, without softening the message, without being picky and choosy about who is standing in front of me, I plan to just tell it as it is, just as we had Micaiah do in the context of these scriptures. So, verse 13 again, he says, As the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. And today, for the people and the leadership in and around the world, for most of the people, for 90% of the people that are living on God's green earth now, God does not have many. He has, in fact, very few good words. He had very few pleasant words, warm words, kind, compassionate words for them. God spoke his kind and compassionate word unto them 2,000 years ago when he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that scripture, that word transcends. This is God's all-encompassing whosoever will may come opening into the whole world to believe on him, receive salvation as a free gift, and be saved forever. Have, possess, grasp everlasting life, a life that does not end. And that's God's extended grace for all men. And you'll find a third of the Bible contains a similar message. Return unto me, return unto me, come unto me, come unto me, believe on me, believe on me. Read through John, it's just believe, 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 Amen. trust, trust, trust. God is just reaching out to all men that they would be saved. For he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But aside Amen. from the one third of the Bible that is pointing in that direction, there's also this two thirds of the Bible that we have to deal with and believe and trust. And that is the negative portion of scripture where God is saying very negative things that refuse the gift, very negative things to people that refuse him, reject him. So as this world waxes worse and worse, as the Bible promises, as, as people get deceived and are deceiving, as the thing in this, the, the times of this world and the people in this world continue to get worse and worse and worse, we can expect the message of God to this world, speaking to its heirs, to also wax worse and worse, intensifying in the heat, intensifying in the vitriol for those that would commit such sins. And it's not even the sins that are the problem, it's the rejection of the free gift. It's the rejection of God that is ultimately the problem. Because God saves sinners, of who I am chief, the Bible says, the Apostle Paul said. So sin aside, God will save the people that will only believe. But the error that you find in this world so often is not that they just won't believe, it's that they hate God. And they're turning away from God. They want nothing to do with God. Criticism and malice from the word of God, I believe, is only a response to the criticism and malice directed to the word of God. So the criticism that comes from the word of God is God responding to people because they have done the same Unto him. If you go to John chapter 14, turn to John 14 in your Bible. In John chapter 14, beginning in verse 15, John 14 and verse 15, the Bible reads, If ye love me, keep my commandments. In verse 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 16. And I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be with you. I will not leave you comfortless. And then down in verse 21 it says, He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself unto him. Here God promising that those that know and keep his commandments, what's the greatest commandment that you could keep, is to believe and trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ. This is my commandment, the Bible says. So to trust and to believe upon Jesus Christ is keeping his commandments. Why? Because Christ 
kept the commandments. But further than that is in the Christian life, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And I said all that to round it out into that final statement where he says this, he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. Jesus is saying that, hey, the love of God, already saying that the Spirit shall abide in them, the love of God the Son, God the Father, shall be on those that love Christ and love God in the same way. Therefore, when you're hearing harsh words, when you're hearing hard preaching from the pulpits, from the scriptures, from the Bible, from the messenger of God, from the prophet, it's only a symptom of the rejections of messages from the past. The reason why we have to thunder out negative messages all the time and we can't just always be talking about the love of God is because nobody loves God. And if nobody loves God, then God's not loving them. And so we call to people to change. We call to people to repent. We call to people to get it right, to believe on Christ, to turn to Him, to love Him by applying what he has taught you through the scriptures and doing what was said. When people are constantly Christians and non-believers alike, when they're constantly just refusing the preaching that's coming towards them, do not be shocked when that preaching gets firmer and firmer and firmer and firmer. The same thing happens with my son Caleb. I ask him nicely the first time, and as he rejects my commandment, as he rejects my words unto him, Gradually, my words get sterner until eventually there is the there is the application of the board of correction, right? The application of the proper punishment. And this is what God is doing. He's constantly saying, "Believe, trust, believe, believe, believe." He's constantly saying, "Repent, turn, do right," and people are refusing. People hate the message. They hate the word of God. So the contempt for criticism is a result of people that are constantly being correct, and eventually they don't want to hear it anymore. And the contempt for criticism in this day and age is becoming to the point where it's reaching a tipping point. See, first what you have is you have a whole generation of millennials who where you tell them you failed at something. You tell them you did a poor job. You tell them you need to do better next time, speaking now potentially of the workplace. They suddenly need a safe space. They're going to crawl away and they're going to cry because someone hurt my feelings by telling me that I did a poor job at work. Secondly, these same, if there's enough of them gathered into one place, they don't need a safe space because eventually that safe space is filled out. It's just full of these crying, wimpy 20-somethings who have had their feelings hurt. And now you have a multitude of crying, wimpy 20-somethings who had their feeling hurt. And they begin to lobby. They begin to push their agenda. They begin to be more aggressive with their hurts and in this emboldened state, they go out and they demand justice. They demand retribution to the one that hurt their feelings with words. And it all ends and climaxes at the point where you have in John 16 verse 2, where whosoever killeth you will think that they do God's service. This is the escalation. First they get their feelings hurt. Then there's enough of them that have their feelings hurt that they turn and they rend you. They turn and they find ways to enact the government to, to hurt you. They enact, they enact the, the multitude of them to come at you and hurt you. Because there's power in numbers, even when the numbers make up individuals who are just wimpy 20-somethings. And it ends as the Bible prophesied. Whosoever killeth you we think, will think that he doeth God's service. See, criticism and truth spoken are going to be named wrong. They're going to be labeled mean, evil, hateful. And in many ways, they already are today. And the only way that people can get rid of them is, yes, to put them away, to silence them, to block them on social media. But the end is that whosoever silences the negative criticism is going to be one that is looked at as right and acceptable and good. And the best way to silence opposition is to destroy it, right? And this is what we have is that, yes, one of these days, I've already got the PayPal taken out, but they're going to cut my feed from YouTube, right? They'll remove my voice in that standpoint. Then they're going to find a way to enter into the home, into the church house, wherever we're going, they're going to stop it there. I'll still preach it in prison. Then they're going to find a way to remove that as they did John the Baptist. Take off the head. Right? The only way to silence that truth going forward is the logical end of it all. And when that happens, whosoever killeth you, whosoever killeth the word of God, will think that they doeth God's service. They'll think that they're doing right. They'll think that they're doing acceptable and good things. 
Well, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, who have their minds twisted in that way, where they think that something righteous, the word of God being preached, is actually wicked, and they think that when they stop it, that they've done a right thing. Our voice today is contrary to culture. We would all agree with that. And today, hate speech laws are such that they are being implemented more and more, and on the books can be implemented with intensity. Prison, then, is a very real and present threat if you are believing the Bible and preaching the Bible. Amen. There is a present reality. It's on the books, and when they're enforced, it'll be such that, hey, you've spoken something deemed hateful by the wimpy 20-somethings. You're going to prison for a long time. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Now, I'm thankful where I stand today to be a part of a church that's full of bold preachers. I'm thankful today to be a part of a church that doesn't water down the message when they go. But they'll give it to people straight. They'll tell them, hey, you are on your way to hell if you don't believe the words that I'm speaking unto you today. They will go and with the hard topics tell people, hey, if you believe that way, you're wrong and you're doomed. Hey, if you believe and act that way, you are wrong and in danger of the judgment. I am in a member here of a church of bold preachers at the door, bold preachers in the pulpit, bold preachers in every opportunity of their life. So it it makes me happy that I'm not the only one. And it is just as likely as any one of us to come under the fire that results of preaching the Word of God. That same spirit is within each and every one of us. That same message is going forth. And I'm not the only one that holds it. And that makes me feel good. We here stand at Sound Words Baptist Church on the truth. And the truth divides, does it not? Jesus said, I came not to send peace but a sword. Everyone wants to make Jesus into this peaceful guy that just sings Kumbaya and brings everyone together. But by his own word, he said, it's not peace that I'm bringing. It's a sword. And a sword is meant for one purpose. And that's to cut. And that's to divide. In Matthew chapter 10, and in verse 34, we have this quote. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to send a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So houses is where you would expect the most peace. People dwell under the same roof. You would expect that they would get along. But the reality is, is when Christ enters in with his sword, with the word of God, it divides. In other words, it draws a parting line, it cuts, and then everybody is going to fall on whichever side they fall. This message divides. And think today. There is nothing more. I know people always want to talk about the reprobate doctrine, or they want to talk about how we believe about Israel. They want to talk about all these hot button issues. But today, I believe that the most offensive message contained in these words is I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the way. What divides more than Christ saying, I am the way? Muhammad was not the way. Buddha was not the way. Confucius was not the way. Joseph Smith was not the way. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is nothing more offensive and divisive to those who are not with him, on board with him, walking in his way, than that message. I am the way. If you're not on it, what do you mean? What am I? My chocolate? People get offended instantly because Christ has drawn that line. And obviously that's the first line that is quite often divided into a house. I was, I was in a house that was not Christian. And when Christ dropped his sword and said, I am the way, and I fell on his lot, the rest of the house did not. And now you have a house divided. The Bible says that house shall not stand. Variants fell in that house. The foes were revealed and it was they of my own household. He divides, and when he divides, it's our responsibility to get on his side. Verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Christ paints the picture of hatred towards those that are not on his side. Why? Because he has the 
caused a line of so much division whereby if you are with him, the opposition is so far against you because Christ is so infinitely high that it is like hatred. It is just as if instantly and in a moment of time you were in hatred with your loved one. You were in hatred with those of your household simply because Christ stepped in and said, I am the way, and you believed it and said, yes, you are and fall in line with God's plan for your redemption. And we need to be willing to follow him in that unto the end. It's never going to be a point of your salvation to follow Christ in his works. But doing that brings you into that relationship where he said, if you love me, I will love you. You will be in that mutual relationship of love and Christ will lead you as you follow him unto the end. You continue reading down, it said, He that receiveth you, now talking to the one that believes Christ, the one that received Christ, says, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And so with the lines drawn, we see the prophets are now one with another. The righteous are now one with another. Christ has in these statements divided. He has in these statements set forth that there would be division and it is going to be offensive. Why? Because now the prophets are together. The righteous men are together. And what is their commonality? Is that they are together with Christ and they shall receive a reward for that stand. The world at large then, we know, will not receive the Lord. They hate Him. And if you are with Him, as promised, the world hates you too. And so then, persecution, tribulations, bonds, imprisonment shall come, and it could come at any moment. You don't know when something that comes out of your mouth, because for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, might offend somebody. Somebody might say something at work, at the bus stop, at uh, the restaurant. Someone might say something and the abundance of your heart that is fully in lockstep with the word of God that is meditating upon the words day of night might just out of the abundance of itself spew out. And you might rebuke someone. You might chasten somebody. You might tell them, nope, that's wrong. The Bible says this. And in a moment, you could have persecutions and tribulations in your life. Expect them. Be anticipating of them because that's what the Bible promises. And in the end, some of these will, I believe, for many of us or those that are friends with us, will end in prison. Micaiah ended up in prison. Joseph ended up in prison for prophesying unto his brothers. Jeremiah ended up in prison for prophesying unto a whole nation of the judgment of God which was to come. And we can look at these examples of good men who found their way in prison amongst thieves and robbers because they had proclaimed a word which was deemed offensive by the people, by the majority at that time. And in the New Testament, those were Old Testament examples, in the New Testament, you are hardly going to find a disciple that did not find their way into prison. You're going to search the scriptures and just find a handful, perhaps, of disciples that did not find their way into prison. It almost seems as if you're barely a disciple if you weren't whipped and beaten and scourged and cast into prison for at least a length of time. We know the beloved John prison wasn't enough for him. They set him apart to his own desert island where he would rot there and end his life. But even there, God used him to pen the book of Revelation. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 9 it says, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. And that's what the world labels us. We're speaking the truth. We're speaking righteousness. And there in 2 Timothy 2 9, the Apostle Paul says, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Even unto bonds, even unto prison, even unto being chained and removed from the public eye. He is suffering as if he were an evildoer. But he says this, but the word of God is not bound. And that same word needs to be thundered. Whether or not prison is the result. Whether or not bonds are the result. Whether or not you are labeled as evil or hateful. And even so, this is especially true. You can turn to 2 Timothy if you want. 2 Timothy in your Bible. Even so, this is true in Canada. The word of God is going to go forth. And we are going to suffer as evildoers 
if we stand by it and if we preach it. This is imminent. This is present. This is going to happen to us in our lifetime if we continue to believe and to preach the words of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11 says this, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Here the encouragement comes to the preacher. The preacher's there and he's understanding that his calling is one of suffering. For the which cause I suffer these things. He's experienced pain and suffering here at the end of his life and he's retelling these stories. But he says this, I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So against that final day, the final reckoning, when I finally breathe my last breath, I have trusted in Christ and it's why I am able to go through these things. So we see quite often that God will encourage those that are suffering. He will take of himself and make himself very personable. Where the Apostle Paul says, I know whom I have believed. And with such certainty he's saying, I know Christ. I have been with him. The Bible says in one place that no one stood with him except for Christ. The Apostle Paul experienced revelations where he walked with Christ upon this earth. And he is encouraged by it. But how should we then, who are on the outside, act towards the Apostle Paul who is on the inside? There's going to be two parts of the revelation of preparing for prison that I'm going to reveal. And that's the one that's in prison and the one that is without prison for the time. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13 says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Hold fast is the first thing we need to do. If we're not the one in prison, we need to hold fast to the truths that would get you put in prison. Why? Because perhaps you're next. Plan on it. Know that these truths, by example of the scriptures, result in persecution, tribulation, imprisonments even, bonds is where they're ended. But the thing is, is that instead of holding fast, sadly, many of these days when they begin to see trouble coming, they remove themselves, they quit, they give up. Verse 15 says, This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. From the Apostle Paul, from one of the greatest preachers who penned so much of the New Testament. What are they turned away from? His precepts, his statutes, his judgments, his words, his self, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy, he says this, to when so many have turned away, he says in verse 13, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. And that's what happens to so many when they see their friend, their brother, end up in persecution, is that they will turn from them. Why? Because they are ashamed of his chain. They're ashamed of the struggle. They're ashamed of the ridicule. And to me, that's the time when you need to stand most with your brother, is when they're going through something. Thing. When they come into the public eye, when they have attacks and persecutions coming upon them, that's when we need to stand with them, just as Onesiphorus did. Verse 17, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So here, what did he do? Well, the free, they need to stand. They need to get into the fight, settle in their hearts that you could end up just as the Apostle Paul, if you believe and preach these same things. And I myself have settled it in my heart that if I believe the same teachings of Paul, I may find myself in these types of situations. Just reckon it to be so. That way when it happens, as Christ said, behold, I've told you before. That way when it happens, you will not be shocked, you won't be alarmed, you won't be offended. Right? And if you're not in that position and you see one of your brothers fall into the ridicule, into the attacks of this world, you need to lift him up. You need to support him or her. You need to refresh them and you need to minister to those that suffer in the service of Christ to the best of your ability. Even as Onesiphorus, who sought out Paul in Rome 
and found him, who went unto him to minister unto him, knowing the risk, knowing the cost, knowing the chain that he had could fall upon him. This is what we need to do. We need to get into the fight and render it to be so that we could end up as that man and yoke with him when he ends up in that situation. When the Paul in our life falls into contempt and into ridicule and into imprisonment even, refresh them, minister to them, pray for them. Three points that you see about people in prison. First, they need to be encouraged in faithfulness. In freedom, pray for their freedom perhaps, but also they need to be encouraged in fruitfulness. If you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 11. No, sorry, Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, you're going to find faithfulness. Encourage men who are imprisoned in faithfulness. Render that you need to encourage yourself and grow in faithfulness should this ever come upon you. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in prison, in the prison, the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor of the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. When people are in prison, they need to be encouraged and prayed for in faithfulness. They need to be faithful. One thing that you can do if you're on the outside is pray for them that their faith would not fail. If you find yourself in prison, pray unto God. Strengthen yourself in faith. Believe Him. Trust in Him. Reach out to Him and ask that He would give you more faith. Give you a measure of faith and increase it. Pray for those that are in prison that they would be able to keep that faith and not get disheartened as John did here. And if you are found in the state of John, if you are found in prison, understand that Jesus is there. Understand that he is there to encourage you and to strengthen you. Even as Jesus said the messengers, he said the word back unto John. And what was the word? The word was that, again, I tell you, those things which you hear and see, that the blind are receiving the sight. The gospel is being preached. And then he leads off once the messengers go to say some things. What went you out for to see in the wilderness? A reed shaken in the wind? A man clothed in the soft women? Behold, they were soft clothing. Those that wear soft clothing are in case houses. But if you went out to see a prophet, you found more than a prophet. He says this of the Apostle John. He says, greater is he than any man I've seen. He is the greatest born of women, the Apostle John. He says these great encouraging words. And even so, if you found yourself in prison... Jesus is there saying those same encouraging words about you. Even when you're doubting, even when you're wondering, even when you're worried about whether or not he is the Christ. Look at the, look at the doubt that John had. Jesus sent his word, comforted him, and said great things about the man that had believed on him and preached him so faithfully so many years ago. But that's what prison can do to people. It can discourage them. It can cause their faith to falter. They will never lose their salvation. But man, they may feel like it. They may feel like God has forsaken them. God hasn't forsaken them. So if you're not in prison, pray for those. If you are in prison, don't lose faith. Don't be disheartened. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. I'm just going to go to three portions of scriptures. Read through them quickly. Just give a few points. People that were in prison. Acts chapter 12. And in verse 1. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatrains of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him to, forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. They're praying for his freedom. They were praying that he would be released. They were praying that he would be encouraged. And this is where I got the idea for the, the sermon. How much can we do as a church if we find that one of our brethren comes down onto hard times because the world hated his message, the same one that we believe? How much can we do for a brother or sister that falls into prison for them 
We can pray for them. We can encourage them in that way without ceasing as a church. And this is what I want to be as a church. Encourage one another because we all believe here the same messages. We all believe here the same books. And it's just a matter of lots falling. Who's the next that's going to come into hard times because the world hates the message that we're speaking? What we need to do is not leave them, not abhor them, not to be ashamed of their chain. But that's when the church needs to come together and pray without ceasing. Here they prayed. First we saw faithfulness. Second, now we see they're praying for his freedom. The Bible says when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and the light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. And here we say, the Apostle Peter, in such doubt, this is the reality that his prison was such that he was bound by two chains, kept by two soldiers. Outside there was even guards keeping the prison locked tight and sealed. He thought it was over. He thought there was no hope. Here perhaps he had a lapse of faith as John the Baptist did. But now he gets smited upon the side. The angel of the Lord comes unto him, wakes him up, tells him to get dressed for going out. It says in verse 10, And when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent the angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews, with everything stacked against him, as he is led about. And I can't blame him. I mean, when I was in a prison like that, and now I'm being led through first, First word, second word, the gates of the very city, and finally the angel leaves, and suddenly reality hits, and I'm free. I would, I don't blame him for not understanding and not believing that which he had seen. He probably thought he was just dreaming of such liberation, dreaming of such freedom. But now he says, I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and delivered me, not only from the prison, but from the very expectation of the Jews that wanted him dead. And the Jews were those limp-wristed, wussy 20-somethings that rallied around and decided that they didn't like the message, so they put it into the deepest, darkest dungeon that they could, bound it with two chains. They took the word of God and they put guards around. They took the word of God. They banned it from all frontiers so that the word would never hear. They did everything they could to lock it away, but the messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord came and brought it unto the people nonetheless, releasing it from prison. And we, if we're in this situation, need to believe that the Lord God would send us that very messenger, that angel, that would be there to nudge us on the side, that would be there to encourage us. And when we're cast into prison, we may all not get the same great deliverance that Peter did, but how great and how wonderful is it to those that love the scriptures to have the messenger of the word of God nudge you on the shoulders and say, hey, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Wake up. Thus saith the Lord. Encourage yourself. Get up. You can do this. You're fine. You're, you're strengthened. Be encouraged. And that's exactly what the angel did, but so much more in releasing him. And if we're the ones on the outside, pray just as this church did, without ceasing. Just begging God to send that same angel. Begging God to release their friend. Begging God that they would see him again. You read on in this passage and you'll find that even the church was alarmed when he showed up at the door, supposing they had seen a ghost. Why? Because they thought that the word of God would be bound. But the word of God coming from the Apostle Peter was not bound. Glory to God. Pray unto God, whether you're in prison or whether you are free and know a brother who is, that faithfulness would remain. That freedom would be had, whether it's just the word of God nudging you on the shoulders and encouraging you. What freedom there is in that? To be bound but still have the word of God impressed upon you. That's freedom. That is, that is joy unspeakable and full of great glory to have the words of God brought into remembrance by the Spirit of God at such a time as that. Faithfulness, freedom, the next is fruitfulness. Go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. <laughs> Acts chapter 16, you'll start in verse 16. Fruitfulness. 
Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So here we have that prophet, uh, we have that name it and claim it preacher. We have that spirit of divination coming upon that false Christian. She's claiming things that sound true. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. She was saying the truth, but the Apostle Paul knew better and exposed her for what she was. And in the name of Jesus Christ, rebuked that false spirit and it came out of her. That spirit of divination left her. And so, as it is this day, they have the voice, they have the messenger, they have the smiley Joe Osteen standing up there, that spirit of divination, the spirit of divination preaching, possessed with that same spirit, that message. Um, you know, these are the servants of the Most High God. This is the way of salvation, but we know him to be a devil by his fruits, by the other expositions, by the other things that we see. Even as the Apostle Paul, we've been given an understanding to recognize that false spirit. And here he stands up, and just as it was that day, there was the messenger who was possessed with the devil, and then there was many others who were the masters of that same devil who had great gain. And here the Apostle Paul recognizes, exposes, and preaches against that false prophet, and it comes out of her. Verse 19 says, And when her masters saw that the hope of their gaze was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither observe, being Romans... And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And here they take those that expose the false teacher, expose the false prophet. And the first thing they want to do is they want to, they want to attack him. Why? Because he's exposed the lies and their gain was lost because of it. That same spirit of divination to hold captive the audience, to control and to possess the minds and the hearts of great multitudes of people was removed. And the only thing that they saw was their gains were missing. And so because the preacher stood against the falsehood, they decided to take the, into their own hands to take that preacher and cast him into prison. Receiving such a charge there, the jailer, knowing the severity that would come was he to let them go, cast them into the innermost portion of the prison, to the inner prison, and made their feet, feet fast in the stocks. Now here in verse 25 it says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed, and saying, Praise unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprung in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Cyrus, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, Amen. and thy house. Amen. So here, the message went forth, and the message that he preached was of such contempt into the world, they cast him into prison, lay his feet fast in the stocks, the prison guard keeping them the best they could. A miracle enters in, no doubt because the church, again, was praying. No doubt because the church was adding unto them spiritually that they would not lose faith. That their freedom would come unto them. They're singing, they're praising, they're glorifying God. Their spirits are high and lifted up. God brings the prison walls down when they could have escaped. They recognized that this was a fruitful opportunity and they waited 
for that jailer to enter and ask those words, what must I do to be safe? So when we are caught up in prison, pray that that opportunity is fruitful. When we are caught up in, in persecution and in tribulation, pray that that's just an opportunity that would be fruitful. Christians, pray for your brethren as they go through things, that they would have boldness to make known and to maintain the testimony, that they would be given opportunity to preach the word of God. Look what they did first. They saw the men that had everything removed from and they saw the man that they were trying to destroy singing and praising the God whose word they preached who got them in that problem. What a testimony these men carried into prison and as a result, these, this jailer walked in when they could have left, when they could have escaped for the sake of the man that was about to thrust himself through. The Apostle Paul stayed and he asked all the, all the other prisoners to stay the same and instead of seeking for his own opportunity to leave, he called out and said, don't kill yourself. You need to know this same Jesus. You need to know why I'm rejoicing. And he comes in, he entered and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? How can I have such a testimony? I was going to let go of this life. I was going to kill myself because things are so bad. Here you are in jail and you could have been liberated. You could have got out, but you stayed and you waited. Why? Because the Apostle Paul, I believe, had Christians praying for him that his faith wouldn't fail, that he would be granted freedom, and he was. But not only that, that the opportunity that was put before him that none of the other ones had, no one else had the opportunity, I know it's hard to say that, to be thrown into prison, had, had that, that blessing to be cast into prison, right? No one else had that same opportunity to the end that one soul would be saved. And not only that, but his whole house with him. So we... We need to pray for our brothers who are going through tough times for boldness that they continue to maintain that testimony and bring forth the same gospel and use the opportunities that they're in to the glory of God the Father. And if you're in those situations, believe that the Lord has a purpose for you. If the world is coming down upon you, if you're being tried, if you're being tempted, if you're going through tribulation and suffering and anguish because of the words that you said and the retaliation of the world that hates the words of God, you need to believe that God has a purpose for even that. And even if you're cast into prison, there might be a jailer there waiting to know the salvation of God. And you may be the exact messenger that was placed there for such a time as this. Remember that the word of God is not bound. And though we may be cast into prison, and I believe that if we keep on this straight and narrow path, the way Canada is going, it will not be long before they start plucking us up and hitting us with citations, losing our jobs, losing whatever, anything, everything being cast into prison. Though we are bound, the word of God is not bound. And I've said it before, the only way to stop the proclamation of the word of God from a Christian believer is to remove their head. And that's exactly what says will happen in the end times. The preaching of the cross, though it's foolishness to those that are perishing, will not cease to go forward. Bind it all you want, the word of God shall not be bound. But as Christians, as believers, we can use those situations. We can pray for those that are in the situations to the end that God would be glorified and he would increase and his message would increase and he would get all the glory. And that is the end. Plan for prison. Plan for prison. 